It's Mama Mondays. You know what to do. Breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out. And unfortunately, I'm in a bit of a rush today. It's not wise to do Momo Monday in a rush, but I am suffering a time crunch. Um, so I'll try to be somewhat wise and erudite, but no promises. Uh, I am talking about, yes, uh, to an extent, the Matt Lee's talk at Gamescom, but not quite, because uh, unlike some people who just completely lost their you-know-what about it because it dis discussed the dreaded Gamergate, dun-dun-dun, um, I found it um, fluffy, rambling, and really... Um, I guess I've gotten to the point where I'm old enough that there are that I make a fairly rapid decision about what opinions I'm going to take seriously and what opinions I'm going to dismiss based on the self-described uh, description that Matt Lees gave of himself, which is somebody who acts stupid for a living. And at that point, it's like, oh, relatively financial com financially comfortable English-speaking white man. I am just going to dismiss. Uh, most of what you say here, not that he didn't say some interesting things, but I have a hard time taking viewpoints like that seriously because he does not um, associate with games. He does not connect with video games the same way someone like me does. No woman or non-white person um, can get away with acting stupid. We spend so much of our time, especially in this industry, trying to constantly prove ourselves because there aren't the presumed competencies that guys very much like Matt Lees enjoy. And this is why different viewpoints are so important and why I think it would be really interesting to do a conference where everybody talks about the same subject, but everybody comes at it in a different way. Because I think um, comparing apples to apples is the only way to really show diversity of opinion. Unfortunately, when you get these topics, only one person can talk about it at a time. And so people don't feel like more viewpoints are presented and people feel left out and the the idea that you know he went on about grout and cement and filling gaps and everything like that and he, he seemed to connect to games in a way that was sort of people are doing it because they're bored they're time wasters whatever he sort of on he, he came close to kind of understanding it in that um you know, games, he says games are medication for the soul, but then he pulls away from it. It's really easy for all these white Westerners in gaming to go on and on and about and on about the soul of gaming and all this stuff, but they really can't connect to the realities of the vast majority of people who spend days... Um, in jobs they hate, being treated like garbage by their bosses and their co-workers and their families and all this stuff, there's not much on the horizon to look forward to because, you know, the UK is dealing with Brexit and the US is dealing with everything the US is dealing with. And here in Canada, we're dealing with being a relatively small country by population who is very much at the mercy of much larger economies messing up and dragging us down with them. Um, and people can't walk around scared. So this idea of games as distraction, I really disagree with. Uh, the idea of games as reality. I really disagree with. There's more going on here. Now, interestingly, 
Something else happened this weekend, and that was the Conor McGregor Floyd Mayweather fight. And I thought this was an interesting juxtaposition, and this is why it's on Momo Monday. This is where sort of the contemplative element is coming into it. That I really like boxing, despite myself. Rocky, a lot of the Rocky movies are some of my all-time favorite films. I loved Creed. I love the way they've evolved the franchise. The Rocky films always say something through the metaphor of guys beating each other bloody. And all this stuff about what games do and what games encourage and, and cultural complicity and all this stuff. I mean, I, I think, you know, the minute games start um, uh, saying, think about what you're encouraging and and all this stuff you know examine what behaviors your game encourages you're you're missing the point because games i think this is where people miss the idea that it's not anymore so much about beating the game although for some people that sense of achievement is essentially important the 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 idea is that people can be whatever they want to be in a lot of video games, that no one is forcing them into a role. You can choose your role in a video game. You can choose who you get to be instead of just being play instead of just playing the hand you're dealt. I mean, I can be a big burly guy with mutton chops in a video game. Then that means that I can kind of get away from the reality of you're fat, you're a whore, you're a slut, you're a stripper, you're a this, you're a that. And you know what? I've gotten really good at dealing with that, but I'm so tired of it. Like, it's so old. It's so boring at this point. The, the preconceptions that people have of me over things that I can't control. And I hear this again and again and again with gamers. Is the world assumes too much of them. And, you know, the, the other thing about gaming is people assume when you're talking to a gamer, the default is, you know, a, a white western european or american person and a lot of people i talk to in communist countries their their reality is very different their personal history the history of their countries is very different and they connect to stories like the witcher in a in a very different way and so they should that those games were made by their countrymen based on a a uh, book by a countryman and they're picking up on the subtext in a way that people in america people in in uh in britain and, and places like that that have have lived in relative safety comfort and freedom compared to people of similar age in former soviet bloc countries and um, I, I disagree strongly with the sentiment of imagine your game wholly defines someone's viewpoint for the world. I, I, I believe the complete opposite. I don't believe games should define someone's viewpoint. I think games should allow the space for someone to define their viewpoint for themselves. And watching the coverage of the McGregor-Mayweather fight or the Mayweather-McGregor fight, these things are very important in negotiation, but I don't care. Um, if you read British press like The Guardian, or you read American press like CNN here, The New York Times, things like that, these two different viewpoints are describing a completely different fight. And I pulled these two headlines up just so you can see the contrast. The British side is saying McGregor and Mayweather were the only ones enriched by this fight. And the Americans are going, it was worth every penny. And I think that there are different uh, cultural backdrops at play. Now, first of all, this was one of those things everybody was going in not to see who would win, but to see how badly or how well Conor McGregor would lose. And in, in some ways, I feel like the lead up 
for me, miss the mark with all the trash talking and everything like that. I know that's an element of boxing, but it just seems so contrived this time. The the guy who should have been the the face to use a wrestling term, should have been McGregor because all he could really hope for was a moral victory and yet McGregor was playing the heel. And it this was a heel versus heel bout for a lot of people and I know I'm comparing wrestling, UFC, and boxing but in a match like this, the lines do blur. Um, but... You know, McGregor was the one bouncing all around and saying, dance for me, boy. And and I didn't realize, yeah, it's funny because I'd heard the term boy used in the Irish context. And obviously it means something completely different when a white American is saying it to a black American. And Conor McGregor got in a lot of trouble, dropped the crap for a bit and uh, apologized for calling for telling Floyd Mayweather to dance for me boy you you'd think that they they would have cautioned him about that stuff cuz it does mean you know me boyo means something very very different in in the Irish context than it it does in in the American context and uh, one would say he should have known better he's got all this money but here's the thing guys fighters try to avoid getting hit in the head for a living and and often fail they're not the smartest and of course there have been all this hue and cry about how people are ignoring floyd mayweather's um background with domestic violence and all this stuff you know people are trying to make this stuff relevant and i'm like nobody's ignoring it nobody expects either of these two guys to be especially wonderful human beings because we just want to see them punch each other in the head. We don't care terribly about either of them if you really look at it. This is not a, a rocky story where you care very much because you're seeing a match from one fighter's point of view. In this case, however, the British publications, their point of view was through McGregor, and the American publications were through Mayweather. And, you know, the, the emotional charge in the U.S. right now, just, you know, to see... And I, 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 it's tough because I hate that an Irishman, just, just my, you know, my personal family background, because my family had to hide that they were Irish... Uh, when part of it immigrated to the UK because the Irish were such an underclass. Uh, boxing is a sport where people from underclasses can become phenomenally wealthy, and that's part of it. But, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of people in the US right now just wanting to see uh, a, a rich black man beat the shit out of a smug white man. Whether that's right or not, I'm not going to say. It's not for me to say because that gets back to this idea of the importance of distraction and telling people what they should take from something and all this stuff. And I think you're doing entertainment wrong if you think it has to constantly be teachable. I personally enjoy boxing because it's simple and complicated at the same time the stakes are quite high i mean i think one of the reasons they stopped the fight so fast was because there were legitimate concerns that floyd mayweather could very well kill conor mcgregor conor mcgregor's an experienced fighter but he's not a very experienced boxer and yes there are some skills that are transferable but anybody who's played Street Fighter knows that playing a character you were fighting primarily with your legs, like Chun-Li, is very different than an upper body based fighter like uh, Ryu and Ken. I always found uh, Guile kind of interesting back in the classic Street Fighter days because he, he was sort of both. You know, he had the, the sonic boom and then he had that, that um, flip kick. And most of the characters were one or the other. I mean, uh, Edmund Honda had mainly arm-based attacks, so maybe he's a better 
example because Ryu had that that uh, windmill kick as well. So, um, but yeah, you know, I thought it was it was fun. It was spectacle. It reminded me of that Rocky movie where he fought Hulk Hogan, which was sort of you know making fun of the spectacle of it. But the spectacle really matters. There were apparently a great many drunken Irishmen stumbling around Las Vegas this weekend, which I think is kind of hilarious because they knew they were going to lose, but, or their, their, their guy was going to lose, but it was an excuse to get out there and act stupid and scream and yell and carry on. And for a lot of people, that's what video games are as well. It's for a lot of people not about winning or losing. The people that actually scare me are the ones that are, are really, really invested in winning. Those are the guys that um, somewhat keep me out of multiplayer. I mean, esports is something different, right? Like esports is competitive. The whole point there is to win. I'm talking recreational gaming. Um, that one guy who is just obsessed with winning and gets really angry if he loses and all that stuff, that that type of person I find really unpleasant to be around just I think and it's just a personal thing it's just because I deal with so many people like that I see it in my line of work so much people who are so hungry people who are who need the dominance so badly that that's what I'm escaping in games I like the fact that you know I can have Lara Croft bounce off a rock and fall into a river 16,000 times because I missed the jump. It's the one that matters, right? That ability to fall and get back up and fall and get back up and fall and get back up until you get it is very therapeutic for me in video games because I don't get that in real life. I have always been a big believer in, in second, third, fourth, fifth chances. If somebody has a real desire to learn something. And too often in life, we are not allowed those opportunities. It's all or nothing. You have one shot and that's it. And I don't think the human spirit can really survive that many all or nothing things. And, you know, you hear from gamers a lot, the only winning move sometimes is not to play. And what's interesting among these people who have sort of checked out of social expectations, and yeah, they may be living in their parents' basement, and they may be playing video games for 14 hours a day, and maybe working for four at a part-time job. But what they've actually found is their reported happiness is higher. And isn't that, at the end of the day, what we're actually chasing? All the money, all the comfort, all the financial success? Aren't we chasing this because it's supposed to make us happier? Well, if these guys have checked out, if they're perfectly happy, and, and this is what happened in, in Japan with the lost decade and, you know, sort of the rise of otaku culture, a lot of these guys were like, forget it. The, the system is rigged. Um, and you don't tend to hear people using the system is rigged to say the system is rigged in my favor. How does this go back into the idea of cultural complicity and, and white dudes who admit they act stupid for a living try to tell the rest of us what we should want out of our games and what we should want to make out of our games? If I were to make a video game, and this is still something I hope I have the opportunity to do one day, and by opportunity I mean money and time, I would not be interested in encouraging specific behaviors. I would not be interested in defining someone's viewpoint because my favorite games, this is what Bioware games used to do so well. Dragon Age Origins, I think, was really the high watermark where everyone you talk to, every different cultural viewpoint, every individual viewpoint, every view, every character had of the world, you could understand and relate to because... You know, David Gator did such a good job in presenting that world to the player. And then you made your choices about who you wanted to spend your time with and who you put in your party. And it could be a, a totally tactical reason like, hey, they're a really good fighter and I'm playing as a wizard so I need more fighters. But they usually gave you enough 
tanks that you had a choice of two. So if you really didn't like someone, they didn't have to be in your party. But I ended up very much liking every single character. The game did not attempt to define my viewpoint because the Bioware games used to come from sort of the, the Dungeons and Dragons school where you had to create a game world flexible enough that evil characters could be playable characters as well as uh, good characters. And that becomes a real challenge because you have to create a game world that creates rewards and punishments for both lawful characters and chaotic characters and, and good characters and evil characters. And when somebody can do that, that to me is the high point of game design. That flexibility, the fact that your world can bend but not break. That's part of the reason I like Saints Row a lot more than I like Grand Theft Auto. I find that Grand Theft Auto really does encourage certain behaviors and define the viewpoint. And that's, that's okay. Some people like that. Some people like going into a defined viewpoint. Whereas I feel like not only is the game encouraging me towards criminality because that's what the game's about, but the game is trying to emotionally manipulate me into feeling a certain way about that criminality through the fact that Michael doesn't stand a chance and, sorry, not Michael, Franklin never stands a chance and Michael has this horrible case of affluenza and, um, you know, Trevor seems to be the only guy having any fun. A game like Saints Row, where you can choose to be more of a no noble criminal, where criminality is just a business and you're actually a decent person who cares about your friends, or you can be a complete bastard that loves the ganky bowl and, and you're a sociopath, whatever. Like, I, you can play both types of characters in that game, and the game doesn't break. The idea of complicity is totally wrong-headed when we talk about game design. Because a proper game shouldn't be pushing the player morally one way or the other. It is more powerful to create a game that allows the player to confront in a safe way realistic consequences for various choices. That is how someone learns. That is how someone creates a dialogue with the self, learns who they are and how to be the best person they possibly can be. And that is what I think younger people now, or millennials, we, I think we really have to stop calling millennials that. It's so dated and, and a pejorative now. But people who grew up in helicopter parenting environments or overly structured time, they didn't have the ability to just go down to the local ravine and play with rocks and snakes and look for frogs the way my sister and I got to do when we were kids. And that unstructured playtime is so critically important to a person understanding who they are. The brain needs rest. Any creative will tell you that the brain needs rest. Since a lot of you guys understand computers, I'll leave you with this metaphor. You have to do maintenance on your machine, right? You have to occasionally do a defrag. You have to s install new parts. You have to install new software. You have to do updates. These are critically important right? To protect not only your machine from viruses, but to keep it running in top order. This is what waking rest does for your brain. You need your sleep, but you also need downtime while you're awake. And the current working world with these 80 hour work weeks and these always on and these call me anytime, day or night, you're not allowing your brain to do its maintenance. And so... Video games that allow us that maintenance, allow us that communing, allow the brain to sort of write, to install those updates. That's critically important. And that's what gaming does for a lot of people because they're not allowed that privacy in 
the real world because of Airbnb culture and shared workspace and crunched public transit. And millennials live in a world that is highly overpopulated. And it's, it's very important to be able to spend time with yourself. And there's a lot of that that goes on in gaming that gamers of a certain type really understand because they cherish how important that is. And that's why, you know, I jump over to the boxing and a boxing match is never telling nobody how to live. Except for Rocky, and that's what's so brilliant. When you're going to an event where two guys are beating each other up for your entertainment, nobody is judging you. Nobody is saying, this is wrong, this is not moral, whatever. And that's why we, we not forgive, but we contextualize the transgressions of these guys. We're not saying it's right. I think everybody would be a lot more comfortable if there was a clear good guy or a bad guy. Some people probably not. Some people are like, I don't care. They're beating the crap out of each other. I don't want to like either of them because I don't want to feel bad if something bad happens to them. Could they be somewhat sociopathic or psychopathic? It's very possible. But perhaps things like boxing, things like gaming, things, you know, all these things that are criticized are perhaps channeling people into places where they can be their best selves and contain their worst tendencies, at least to an extent, not completely. I don't know. It's just a question I'm asking because this is Momo Monday. So culturally complicit, perhaps only if you're deciding that you have the right as a person that has been very lucky in telling other people who have been less lucky how to live. That is the ultimate cultural complicity. Lacking so much humility that you tell somebody else how to interact with any world, fictional or non-fictional, right? Okay, we'll leave it there. Breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out.